Thank you for joining this Wanted Literary Festival talk. I'm pleased to be introducing Dr Linda Parker, who is a friend of the festival. Linda Parker is one of the UK's leading historians of religion in the First World War. She has also written a book on polar exploration. Linda is a member of the Royal Historical Society and the Western Front Association, the American Commission for Military History and the Society for Military History. In addition to this, she is also a co-founder of the British Modern Military History Society. Tonight, Linda will be discussing her latest and sixth book, Nearer My God to Thee. This event is free. I would, however, ask that you consider purchasing a copy of Linda's book and making a small donation to the Wantage Literary Festival. Details on how to donate or to purchase one of Linda's books can be found on our social media pages. There will be an opportunity to ask Linda questions at the end of tonight's talk. Please note, this event is being recorded. Over to you, Linda. A role that was multifaceted and intense, involving sacrifice and bravery, which was usually in the front line of battle as airborne padres jump right into the thick of the battle. The airborne trappings dropped by parachutes or they landed by glider in many of the major theatres of war, including North Africa, Sicily, Italy, Arnhem and the crossing of the Rhine. Now, I'd like to include some aspects of the rule which I've been studying and some of which have caused controversy. Um, was their position in the plane or the glider worth giving up um, a, a fighting man for? Uh, to what extent did they take over military roles in heat of battle when the, the military situation demanded it? Uh, were airborne padres ever armed in controversial regulations? And to what extent did they become a sounding board for the commanded officers? And finally, um, to what extent did they have a good effect on the morale of the soldiers? These are some of the things that I've been examining while researching them. At Churchill's express demand, training of parachute troops began on June 1940 at the Central Landing School at Ringway, Manchester. By September 1942, the first parachute brigade had been formed. Recruits did some really severely hard ground training at Hardwick Hall and then went on to jump to school at Ringway. And this is uh, a slide showing the, some of their, their training. Uh, training to jump involved nine jumps from balloons or aircraft and um, before the awarding of wings. Now at first Whitley aircraft was used and one had to jump through a hole in the floor through a tube. And if you don't, didn't keep very upright, you injured your nose or your face. This was called ringing the bell and merited buying a round of drinks in the bar. Uh, this is the Reverend Talbot Mockins in North Africa, Sicily and Arnhem with the 1st Parachute Brigade and he won a military cross at Arnhem. He arrived at Hardwick Hall at the end of 1941 after receiving orders to report to 1P Brigade. Now he didn't know what 1P Brigade was, he discovered at the gate that it meant parachute and he said his first inclination was to retreat rapidly but by that time his transport already gone so he was stuck with it. This is Father Bernard Egan who arrived about the same time and they were the, they were the um, first uh, parachute padres. Now they were posted at first as penguins or non-flying birds but they soon realised that they'd have to have a, to have, they wouldn't have a close relationship with their men at all unless they shared all their experiences and were prepared to go into battle with them. Um, the Royal Army Medical Corps by this time were well advanced in their parachute training and also planning their role in battle. So the chaplains realised they were going to left behind if they didn't start planning and pushing for the fact that they wanted to jump with their men. Having the padres jump train with the men, the chaplains cared for them to the extent that they were prepared fully to stand in their shoes, whatever. Watkins explained his thoughts when he and Egan started the jump training. He said, the nervous and emotional stress is the same for all, chaplains included. The tenseness of the experience arises from the fact that finally each man stands alone. Yet when he's not quite alone, the knowledge that the next man looks as green as you and that acts as a spur. Therein lies a sense of comradeship, which is so characteristic. 
members of the course didn't understand why they were there and were rather scornful. Watkins remembered the look of utter disbelief on their faces. In order to make the point uh, that they were there to minister to men in all the circumstances, they nearly always wore their dog collars, even though that was a little bit uncomfortable uh, in training and jumping. So these two actually set the precedent for the involvement of the Padres in all aspects of training. If they hadn't decided that they had to jump with the men, then probably uh, it would have carried on that they didn't jump with the men and just ministered to them uh, when they came back. Um, parachuting was not the only method of descent for airborne Padres. The Reverend W. Chignall was posted as Camp Padre at Hardwick in December 1943, and he settled down to minister to the groups of men passing through the camp. Then he had a phone call from the Army Chaplains Department, asked if he would volunteer as a chaplain um, to, of number wing pilot at the glider best advice in the mess. And he was told, quote, don't go near that lot of flying coffins. He was advised by one colleague, but Chigwell was all ready to take on the new role and travel to Blake Farm RAF station, the headquarters, to start a new phase of its ministry to the airborne troops. In November, on November the 8th, 1942, the Allies launched their attack on North Africa, Operation Torch. Now, here was the opportunity for the airborne forces to contribute in far larger in, in a large numbers for the first time and to be used in the role for which they'd been to the ground forces and cooperating with them leading the way. Airborne troops landed and captured Bone Airfield and the road junction at Sukalaraba. They were accompanied by the Reverend Roy Price, who therefore became the first airborne chaplain to jump in combat. The second battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, landed with the aim of capturing several enemy airfields on November the 29th at EPN, but they were not so successful. They came under heavy attack, and also the ground troops they were supposed to meet up with never arrived. Yes. And um, Reverend Murder MacDonald, a fiery Scottish padre with a reputation for straight talking, was wounded in captures. He was evacuated by plane with the medical officer, uh, Lieutenant McGavin, and between them they arranged blankets and petrol in the back of the plane. As they got off, they set a time pencil explosive, which was hidden in actually in um, his um, sling. As they were walking across the airfield, the plane blew up and the two men narrowly avoided being executed on the spot. Although, strictly speaking, non-competent MacDonald had managed to strike a blow against the enemy, um, he remembered that, in fact, his actions, that he had actually moved over to combat duties before he came to grief in North Africa. Later, en route to a POW camp, he attempted to escape from a train that was recaptured. Um, now, when this book came out, uh, the, the press got a little bit... Um, uh, a bit about it and they did a little bit about they picked on uh, murder mcdonald and um i'd written that he went to the the um, stalag lift three the great escape camp and that he'd been friendly with the people who had organized the escape so this is what they seized on and this is a few of the headlines that came out the scottish minister who inspired the great escape um i don't know really where they really did but he was friendly with them and um he had escaped himself um from a train so um uh, we went with that um, during the North African campaign, which lasted from November 1942 until April 1943, the chaplains were with their men through months of bitter fighting. They fought with the wounded, helped, sorry, they brought in the wounded, they helped with the field hospital, took short services wherever possible, and wrote many letters home to the families of wounded or killed. In his letters home, Watkins liked to include a sprig of whatever bush was growing near the grave as a link with the family to the, to the um, link with the family. Uh, to the grave, and here you can see the memorial to the first parachute brigade in Samara Valley. Uh, the next big action for airborne troops came with Operation Husky, the invasion of Italy in July 1943. A few days before the Operation Husky, Major General Hopkinson, commander of the 1st Airborne Division, invited senior padre A.G. Harper to accompany him to time the nautical sunset at one of the bases set up in the infertile scrublands near the coast where the airborne division had been moved. Harper actually felt this as an excuse for Hopkinson to talk to him about the forthcoming operation of the 1st Air Landing Brigade. Hopkins was aware of the difficulties of landing an entire brigade by glider, but was um, but, but Hopkins was 
attempted. General Montgomery, that a glider landing should be attempted in darkness with untrained air crews and using unfamiliar American gliders. According to Harper, Hopkinson revealed himself in that conversation to be a religious man who was very aware of the fate of the airborne troops, who was dependent on his, his orders and decisions. Major General Hopkinson used Padre Harper as a sounding board for his feelings of guilt if he had made the wrong decision. And this was not an isolated case of Commander Chaplin cooperation. On 9th of July, the glider force then had its first opportunity and set off from North Africa to land near and to take the Ponte Grand Bridge in order to help the Allied advance on Syracuse. This operation was named Ladbrook, then it went disastrously wrong, with 73 of the 144 gliders landing in the sea, where many airborne were drowned and many of the gliders who had reached land landed in the wrong place and being ripped apart. The operation was the source of much animosity between the airmen and the American pilots who ferried them. The pilots, who were not experienced, who were mainly civil aviators who had been rushed in, were accused of becoming spooked by the aircraft fire and casting off their gliders too early. Amazingly, the flew gliders that landed near the bridge managed to take it and hold it until relieved. On the ground, the chaplains who made the landfall buried the dead, helped with the wounded, and helped organise the scattered units. Padre Alan Buchanan was his men, and a senior chaplain reported, quote, he was incredible, and his men really loved him. I was told that in the awful middle of the landing of the South Staffs, they were more worried as to where their chaplain was as to where they were. The operation saw the first fatal chaplain casualty of the airborne force. Father David Hurricane, a Roman Catholic priest, was landed with brigade headquarters with permission to, ask as an to act as an interpreter as long as he wore his collar and a Red Cross armband. His glider just managed to reach the coast, but Hurricane was captured. During the night, an Italian made his way into the place where Hurricane was sleeping and murdered him. Apparently, the Italian troops were convinced that Hurricane could speak such good Italian that he must be an Italian traitor working for the Allies. So the parish brigade then had their moment in the invasion of Sicily on the 10th of July, when they dropped in to capture the Ponte Primso. Again, there were difficulties with navigation and drop sites. And also, they landed very conveniently at the same time and the same place as a unit of German parachutists. However, they captured the bridge eventually. Padre Watkins distinguishing liaising between the front line and the aid posts and eventually leading a group of severely wounded to join up with the advancing allies. Uh, D-Day, next the invasion of Normandy. Now, in the official history of the airborne forces in the Second World War, they also described the importance of the airborne forces in planning for the Second Front, the invasion of Europe. And I quote from that, it says, one thing became very clear, no successful invasion of Europe could take place without airborne forces able and ready to leap over Germany's vaunted West Wall and thus bring its formidable forces to no account. The 6th Airborne Division was formed in May 1943 and began to train for their role. Glider training continued and the ability to put larger and larger formations in the air was, de was developed. 19 Padres um, accompanied the airborne troops, three of whom died. Now, it's only possible to tell you a few tales of the airborne parties in the time available tonight, uh, so I'll, I'll go through a, a few of them. A um, bit of the background. The airborne task was the, task was the first part of the invasion was to protect the flanks of the seaborne operation um, by seizing strategic points and communication centres and so stop German forces reaching the beachhead. The 6th Division was to land, sorry, 6th Division was to land on the left flank. This included the double obstacle of the River Orne and the con and the high ground which overlooked the beaches. It was imperative that the high ground which had overlooked the beaches and the Mobile Battery was captured. Now, this is um, John Gwinnett, who was chaplain to the 9th Battalion, and, was, and the 9th Battalion job was to take the Mobile Battery. He held a service before takeoff and used the words which were to resonate with many of his men. And this is what he said. He said Fear knocked at the door, faith opened it, and there was nothing there. He was also very popular with his men, being described as a paratroopers vicar with an empathy for men. Uh, and he often overlooked the waywardness, their waywardness, and the men loved him for it. 
of the 9th Battalion, Gwinnett landed way off course and struggled landing in large drainage ditches in a flooded area near the River Orne. Many men struggled to get out of the water with their heavy kits and many drowned. I expect if any of you have seen um, the film The Longest Day, it uh, shows this quite, quite well. Um, gathering some men around. Gathering men as he went, Gwinnett eventually made it back to the HQ with the 9th Battalion. I think it took him about 12 hours. Um, to find that they'd managed to take the Milva battery with a very small number of men that they had managed to land near it. Um, at the brigade headquarters near Le Plan, he discovered, when he discovered the 20 casualties uh, wounded during the assault on the battery were lying in a house close to the battery at the stud farm harassed direct further along the Breville Ridge. Although German troops were in the area, Gwyneth commandeered a captured four, four, four big truck anyway, um, to bring in the wounded. Private out drove the vehicle and together negotiated the badly created roads through the mostly enemy territory. At the Harris de Rez, one of the first people he saw was Sergeant Bill Harrod, who had jumped as part of the advance reconnaissance team. Bill's final remark to the chaplain at Broadwell had been, see you on the other side, Padre, I'll have a cup of tea waiting for you. That was only 18 hours before, and now Gwyneth saw Bill coming towards him with a mess tin in his teeth, muttering, not tea, Padre. He had been shot through both arms and hands, and Gwyneth said, unashamedly, I recall the tears came to my eyes. Gwyneth was with the battalion for the ensuing weeks of battle, burying the dead, helping with the wounded, and taking small services where possible. He distinguished himself as one point in the battle by dashing forward to pin the airborne flag to a tree, encouraging the men and improving morale. And I think I found that tree. Um, Gwyneth supervised the evacuation of the wounded nine para to Lemensil and started to arrange the funerals of the dead of both sides, which were lying behind the villa. Ernie Rook Matthew remembered Gwyneth burying his comrades. He said, under the Padre's leadership, comrades who were killed were treated with the utmost respect. In the morning, stand to, our dead comrades will be buried in a shallow grave dug in this plot. The Padre gave every man a Christian burial with some of the man's comrades breaking off from action to pay homage. These services were family services, not military, very simple, most sincere. At one point, Gwynedd ar arranged a ceasefire, which a witness and the witness described the occasion. He said, he was a very brave man. When we were collecting the wounded and dead, we collected them all irrespective of whose side they were on. The Germans did stop shooting, except for one fool who fired, and that was when John Gwynedd, standing up there, turned around and said in the most unparson like language, you stupid bugger, can't you see my bloody dog collar? Uh, apologies for the language. Uh, this is George Parry. You can see how young he is. He was a very young and enthusiastic party of the 7th Battalion, who liked his beer, and they called him Pissy Percy for that. And on one occasion, he wrestled with one of the officers in the mess because he had called him puny, because he was actually quite small. He took the service at camp uh, before the takeoff for D-Day, but also conducted a small service under the wing of an aircraft for a friend called Bill, who was convinced he was not going to survive. The Semth were also dropped scattered and went into action half strength. Parry was a mental aid post at Benefield, which was overrun by German soldiers, who in contravention of the rules of war, killed all the wounded. Parry died a in a valiant but futile attempt to defend them. He is buried at Benefield Cemetery with his friend Bill, who he had attempted to cheer before takeoff, but whose premonition had actually proved correct. This is Padre Bill Briscoe, who was dropped with the 225th Field Ambulance, and he was wounded badly in action in the first few days. Now, he was one of the Padres of the 6th Division who carried a gun. The commanding officers in the division, such as Lieutenant Colonel Pine, um, used to leave a little pile of small arms and stem guns by the planes before they took off. Uh, just in case anyone wanted one, like a Padre. This only appears to have happened in the 6th Airborne, uh, not the 1st Airborne, as officially Padres were supposed to be unarmed. But when he was wounded and lying in a barn, some Germans were head approaching, and he asked the medical officer, David Timms, to take his pistol out of his belt. He said, David, remove my gun. If the Germans find my pistol, they'll shoot me. This Tibbs did, but luckily the Germans passed the barn anyway. Briscoe's next act was to persuade the Aldi to give him a first priority label, as he had been left with a wounded that were considered beyond hope. Wearing this label, he'd be taken for treatment in a blood transfusion, and he recovered and went on to see action at the Rhine crossing. 
as well as George Parry, two other Padres died at the D-Day invasion. Um, firstly, pa Padre George Alexander Harris. He was a Padre with a Canadian battalion. He was British, but he was attached to the Canadian battalion, and he died as his parachute became entangled with another man's on descending. Both men crashed prematurely to the ground. Now, the other man survived, but Harris was dead, and his grave is here at Randville Cemetery. Padre Alec Kay was also mortally wounded as he was out in his jeep carrying back wounded. He's also buried at Randville. David, David Nimmo, um, chaplain to the 2nd Battalion Oxen Bucks, described how when opportunity buried, uh, offered, we buried our dead. At that stage, they were burying them in the Herrilibet Village Cemetery. He organised a burial squad at work identifying the dead, removing their personal effects, digging graves, interning and carefully recording all the necessary facts. He recalled one occasion burying a woman who had been killed by the German troops for aiding a paratrooper. There was no local Roman Catholic priest, so Nimmo asked for a French prayer book and performed the service as best he could in French and according to the Roman Catholic rites. But he couldn't help wondering what his Presbyterian colleagues back in Scotland would have made of it, but he said he didn't care. He went on to describe the burial service under fire. Occasionally, he said, men would have to be buried more or less where they had fallen. On one such occasion, we were in the middle of a brief burial service when, there was, when the mortar bombs began to fall very close to us. We dropped to the ground and there was a pause. It was one of my helpers, a private soldier, who took up the threads got up and resumed the Lord's Prayer, which we had been saying together. Such men were towers of strength. So that's a little bit about D-Day. We're skipping through the Second World War. Um, the next thing the uh, airborne forces were involved in was Operation Market Garden in Arnhem in September 1944. So. Right. 15 chaplains went with the airborne force in Operation Market Garden. Two died, nine became prisoner of war, and three escaped across the river uh, when the airborne forces eventually retreated uh, after nine days of conflict. During this time, the Padres were of necessity at the front line of the battle, as the force was cut off and there was no chance of retreat. They carried their duties and their ministry of presence out in many ways, and I just want to tell you about a few of them. The Reverend Arnold Pair was chaplain to the glider pilot's wing number two and wrote a diary about his experiences. After landing, he brought wounded men. After landing in his glider, he brought wounded men from the gliders into the aid post under fire. He spent much of the battle at the used to be crossroads where the hotels had been converted to field hospitals and cared for the sick in practical spiritual ways. In his diary, he mentions the singing of Abide With Me that was part of the film A Bridge Too Far. Uh, however, lots of other people also mentioned that in different bits of Arnhem, so I think they conflated all a lot of Abide With Me's into, into one for the, for the film A Bridge Too Far. He was eventually taken prisoner of war, staying with the men that had to be left behind when the main force retreated over the Rhine. Then he managed to escape on a train, taken into Germany, and stayed hidden by the Dutch resistance until Holland was liberated. Now, his cover in the Dutch village was of a uh, deaf mute, and apparently played the part so well that at the end of the war, when well, when liberation came, many of the villagers had no idea that they had a British army padre in their midst. Uh, this is Father Bernard Egan again. Uh, the second battalion, under the command of John Frost, was the only unit to reach the bridge, and from Sunday 18th to Wednesday the 20th, fourth. No, sorry, I'm getting over my. Um, sorry, I've lost my way now. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, they fought a desperate battle to retain hold of the bridge featured so heavily in the film aforementioned Bridge Too Far. Uh, Father Bernard Eagman was with them, bringing in the wounded and visiting the soldiers in the, in the hideouts north of He was wounded in the legs and during a temporary ceasefire was evacuated to the German aid posts with about 200 defenders of the bridge and then he became a prisoner of war. Um, he did come home and he did live um, until the 1980s, but he always uh, was incapacitated by the injury to his back. He was never really well again. Um, this is Padre Robert Watkins again, who was pleased to report that he'd made a feather light landing and set off for the bridge with the 1st Battalion. As they came under more and more resistance from the Germans, the battalion became split. And this is where Watkins then finds himself taking over and issuing orders, because he was one of the only officers around. 
As the Allied forces withdrew forming a perimeter, Watkins visited the men, the men scattered defending it and carried messages and orders from the headquarters to groups of soldiers. Once again, he was not actually operating a strictly chaplain, uh, chaplain like manner. When the Allied armies eventually retreated across the Rhine in Operation Berlin, Watkins took charge of parties of soldiers and helped them safely across. In December 1944, he went to Buckingham Palace to receive his military cross. Father Thorne, who I haven't got a photo of, unfortunately, was situated at a medical aid post in the house of Kate to Horst and her family. At first, the casualties were light, but as the battle moved closer to the Rhine, the aid post became overwhelmed by the wounded and dying. Father Thorne impressed Kate by his unceasing action on behalf of the wounded him cleaning blocked up toilets. The dead were piled up outside and Thorne managed to bury 14 men at dawn despite gunfire on Saturday the 23rd. A footnote in Kate Horse's account of the battle gives the information that in all 57 airborne troops had been buried behind the vicarage, probably mostly by Thorne. Thorne gave Kate Horse his Bible in English and asked her to read the 91st Psalm verses 1 to 7 to the groups of wounded, beginning with the words he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Almighty, ending with verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it not shall not come by thee. And again in the film, I think it's, I can't remember who played her now, uh, but you, you have the scene where she's actually uh, saying the psalm. Um, Okay, two Padres were unfortunately killed. Padre Irwin was killed on the 22nd of November when a bomb exploded near to the door of a first aid post near the Hartenstein Hotel at the Oosterbeck Crossroads. And Father Bernard Benson was slightly different. He was injured and he had to have his arm amputated. This is will to live because without his arm, according to Roman Catholic canon law at the time, he wouldn't have been able to administer the sacraments. And he died for no obvious medical reason, well, apart from the fact that he'd had his arm amputated, um, on the 27th of September. Uh, but uh, witnesses said that he just seemed to give up all, all, all desire to live. And uh, Irwin and Benson are both buried at uh, Oosterbeek Cemetery, and this is Benson uh, there. As wounded and prisoners arrived at St Elizabeth's Hospital, uh, the cum at St Elizabeth Hospital, uh, there was um, quite a rash stash of British weapons started building up. Coming to collect these. So, together with the senior medical officer and the Reverend Daniel McGowan, they hatched a plot to smuggle the weapons out to the, out of, out to the Dutch resistance. McGowan arranged a mock funeral and uh, the doctor and three orderlies carried the corpses, in reality arms covered with blankets, out of the hospital on two stretchers in a solemn procession and they were duly buried in two shallow graves which had been dug by the mortuary with McGowan pretending to say the funeral service. The next day the SS came to collect the arms but it was minus three Bren guns, a German like machine gun, some grenades and boxes of ammunition which were duly dug up from the supposed grave and taken away by the resistance. McGowan later escaped from the camp in Oppeldoom and nearly reached the Rhine but was recaptured and he became a prisoner of war till the end of the war. So now a full account, there's loads of really exciting stories about the chaplains in Arnhem, but it would take us all night. Um, but I will say that at Arnhem, the chaplains exercised this ministry of their presence all day and all night throughout the battle. And they were able to be of much spiritual and physical support to the men that they served. Ah, now for something completely different. This is, well, sort of different. Um, this is uh, Padre Fraser McCluskey and he was with the 1st Battalion SAS Special Air Service and he was parachuted uh, behind the lines into the Morvan area in July 1944. Now their aim was to prevent German forces reaching the Normandy landings and also to sabotage transport links. From the beginning, McCusky felt at home with the fierce and rugged men of the SAS. He recalled, there was a great deal of glamour about this bench, but the most experienced operatives were those who took themselves least seriously and provided you fitted in, you were made one of this distinguished family. McCusky dropped with his men into the Morvan area in central France, carrying with him some hymn books, some New Testaments on it, 
and an airborne special Holy Communion set. He was very much against the Padres being armed, uh, as it wasn't allowed anyway, uh, but he did have a bodyguard who sat with him in his jeep bristling with arms, so he was well looked after. He visited the various groups of the SAS regiment in their forest camps and found them very happy to have services. Actually, the volume of singing they did, depending on how near they thought that the, or how near they thought a German patrol might be, but the forest is very deep and dark, um, and so I think they were reasonably safe. Uh, it turned out to be an extremely good getaway drive um, missions. He would sit with the jeep while they went to blow up the train, and then he'd whisk them away. Um, he apparently was quite a demon driver. Um, his story is most exciting. And last summer we had the opportunity to visit the Morvan and we tried to retrace his footsteps, oops, and um, this is some of the places um, that we went. This is a grave of some um, British airmen that came down um, on a, got crashed on a resupply drop and he buried them, uh, Marigny Nicolies, and this is a cemetery in the woods where the resistance, oh, I'm pointing at it, okay. <laughs> there on your right is a cemetery in the woods uh, where resistance uh, man an American uh, liberator plane, um, which was classically buried. But most importantly, and I would have missed this if it hadn't been for my husband, there at the very back uh, were the ashes of the very reverend Fraser McCleskey, or at least part of his ashes. And I felt so honoured to be there um, and to pay my respects to where he wanted his ashes to come back, to obviously, which is a very important part um, of his life. Um, all right, in December 1944, the Allied in France on Germany suffered a setback in the Battle of the Bulge. The six airborne were now required to return to the continent. They were put into line with British 30 Corps as part of an Allied counterattack. The airborne division had been tasked to clear the territory which was being fiercely defended by German troops, so spearheading the advance against the enemy salient. On January the 3rd, their objective was the village of Bure. In the advance on the village, the medical officer David Timms remembered that the main problem to progress was a large tiger tank, I think, yes, tiger tank, dominating the main street. Tibbs sent up a regimental aid post in the village and house with a cellar to deal with the casualties. He discovered that five men were lying in a house with no access past the tank to get them out. So Sergeant Scott of the medical team decided to try and take an ambulance to rescue them, and Padre Foy decided he would accompany them. He would accompany him. The ambulance clearly marked the Red Cross, trended up the road uh, towards the tank and came to a halt outside the house where the wounded men were, just yards away from the tank and its guns. In a moment which has been of high tension and drama, the tank commander's head and shoulders appeared out of the turret, uh, presenting a perfect target. Uh, he shouted in good English, this time you can do it, but do not come back. First back down the road, heading for the field ambulance two miles away. The two men were the heroes of the hour. Um, Sergeant Scott with Padre Foy in strong support and of course the enemy commander, or what men as they were told. Tibbs recorded that the story went round that when the town commander put his head out of the turret to direct his men once too often and was shot, that some of the British men shed tears. And he said, such is war and the strange bonding it can create on both sides. Padre Foy, was awarded a military cross for his action and his continued bravery bringing in wounded under fire in the action in the Ardennes. On March, uh, March 1945, getting towards the end of the Second World War now, the 6th Division were to take part in one of the final acts of the war. They took part in Operation Varsity, which was the airborne part of the Allied crossing of the Rhine, which was the last barrier the conquest of Germany. The ground troop Operation the ground troops Operation Plunder involved the Montgomery's 21st Army Group, consisting of over a million men. The troops who parachuted and landed by gliding into German territory took part in the largest single airborne operation of the war. 540 American Dakota aircraft carried the 12 parachute battalions, five British, one Canadian and six American, closely followed by 1,300 largest single, as I said, largest single lift operation. The 6th Airborne Division was to land and seize the high ground of the Dean's Front Group Wood, which was overlooking the part of the Rhine to be crossed by the land operation. Despite determined opposition and initial heavy casualties, 
Within five and a half hours, all objectives were taken and the link up with the ground forces achieved. Out of the original 7,000 troops, the 6th Airborne Division had lost 1,400 men who were either killed, wounded or missing in action. Uh, this is the Reverend Walter Og uh, Tulipe Ogilvy or Tully. Uh, he was born in County Durham, son of a vicar, and he was educated to Shrewsbury House Prep School. And actually went down to Shrewsbury House Prep School because they wanted me to come and talk about their old boy. And that was a very, uh, a very nice occasion. Uh, he'd already had a full and dangerous experience of war before he joined the Airborne Division um, because he was in the Royal Army Chaplain's Department from 1940. He'd been to Northern Ireland, the Far East, the Middle East, to Brook, Palestine and um, Alexandria. And he was in the Tank Brigade um, before being captured and became a prisoner of war in, in Italy, in Bari. He was repatriated to Britain because he was very ill with diphtheria and then took several months to recover before off he went again to join the Airborne Farm airborne forces, passing out from training in June 1944 and going with the 6th Airborne Division. He went to them to the Ardennes in the Battle of the Belge and then uh, went on Operation Varsity. During the final week before Operation Varsity, a chaplain's conference was being held for all the chaplains that would be taking part and arrangements were made for the eve of battle service. Ogilvy was to drop with the 8th Midland Parachute Battalion. The drop was to be difficult and dangerous as it was to be in daylight, and it was planned that the men should be dropped straight onto their target areas. To... This meant that they ran, ran the risk of coming under fire as they dropped in their parachutes, and many did. Ogilvy dropped successfully, but almost immediately went out under fire to collect wounded from the drop, and despite wearing a Red Cross armband, was sniped and shot late in the day. On the same, so later on the same day, that was the 25th of March, he died of his wounds and he is buried in the Reichwald War Cemetery, uh, Reichwald War Forest Cemetery. Also buried in the same cemetery is Padre J.F. Kennedy, who dropped to the 224th Field Ambulance. The war diary of the ambulance described how they dropped very close to a German strong point consisting of 71 enemy troops. Kenny's body was found in the early evening when the drop zone was being cleared. His shooter became tangled up in the trees and he'd been shot as he hung there, a fit similar to many who dropped that day. The gliders feared no better. Padre Morris McGowan was badly wounded when his glider crashed. However, the 6th Airborne achieved all their objectives and went on to cross Germany, ending up in Wismar with the armistice on May the 8th. And there the Padres took part in a special victory service in Wismar Cathedral. So it can be seen that the Airborne Padres had a special, special place in the hearts of their troops as they were with them throughout the battles of the Second World War. In June 1946, the victory parade took place in London Every arm of the services was represented and the, Alli Alli sorry, and the, RA the Royal Army Chaplains Department was represented by 12 chaplains chosen to represent both denominations and the varieties of service. Watkins was chosen to represent the Army Chaplain, our Airborne Chaplains, and wear the red berry in the parade. He commented that the parade was, quote, a celebration of years of costly human endeavour. The day of the parade, a Saturday, need not be described, he said. It was an occasion for the annals of the Royal Army Chaplains Department, and it was right that the representation of an airborne chaplain should be included. Evidence from airborne troops and commanders showed that the presence of the Padres was appreciated and found to be essential. Commanding officers often used them as sounding posts and confidants, and men and officers found them to be good for morale. More controversially, some airborne Padres took on battle leadership roles, and some were even armed though I've never come across any evidence to show that they ever used these arms. I'd like to put the case that the actions of airborne chaplains in the Second World War acted as a sort of a bridge between the role of chaplains at the beginning of the 20th, beginning of the 21st century in Afghanistan and Iraq. It was in this war, the Second World War, that it was accepted as imperative that chaplains should be in the front line of battle and accompany their troops at all times, offering their ministry of presence before, during and after battle. Airborne Padres operating in a completely new operational context had these opportunities throughout the conflict. They developed closer relationships with men and officers and established a way in which chaplains could be the moral conscience of commanding officers. They brought convention in their cooperation between denominations and willingness to be flexible in the battlefield situation. Reverend Paul Abraham, an airborne chaplain, in his introduction to his draft history of airborne chaplains, said that the main job of a chaplain 
chaplains were to pray and to care, he said. Soldiers expect their chaplain to, to pray. They know instinctively that he's an intermediary between themselves and God. Sometimes the prayer is through the liturgy, at other times informally with a small group. Most often the prayer is offered in the quiet of a chaplain's heart. The second duty is to care, he said. This is the most obvious in times of tragedy. At such time, men look to him for hope and encouragement. It is Christ who can speak through him. In Abraham's opinion, the only way that he can do this is by giving himself without reserve. So I hope tonight that I have shown that is exactly what the Airborne Padres did. Thank you. Sorry, I think I went, went quiet again there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Just saying thank you, Linda, for that talk. And um, I was going to say, is there anybody on the screen here who has a question that they'd like to ask? If you'd like to raise your hand, Richard. So, Richard, I should have oh, just no, asked you to unmute. So Hi. you should be able to unmute yourself. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Linda, thank you very, very much indeed for that talk. And I only want to set personal note to say, to hear the end of uh, Fraser McCluskey. When I was a little boy of seven or eight, uh, we used to go to his church in Bears Den. Ah, oh, right. And then years later, in I think 1985, uh, he was moderator of... Uh, the Church of Scotland or whatever it's called. Yes, he, be he became very high up in the, in the Church of Scotland. Yes. yes, and he came out to Londonderry uh, where I was serving uh, and he had lunch with uh, lots of my soldiers uh, oh, lovely. Who, loved, who loved his tricorn hat and uh, the frills at the end of his sleeves. But above all, he was still a man who could talk to soldiers. It was yeah. lovely to watch and listen. So thank you for telling me where some of his ashes are. Yes, yes, I, would, I, I very nearly missed that, Richard, you know. I was so excited about being in this place, you know, where, and, 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 and Nigel said, oh, look down here, look down here. So, um, yeah, that was great. It was really nice to go over there uh, and sort of follow in his footsteps. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Anybody else for a question? Oh, Adrian, okay, Adrian, I shall unmute you. So you should be able to press a button to unmute yourself now. Hello. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Um. Yeah. Hello again, uh, Linda. We actually were on the um, the, the World War One version of your talk a couple of weeks back. So. Thank oh, you. right. I remember. Yeah. 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 yeah thank, and thank you again for tonight. That's very interesting. Um. A question I've I've got probably on behalf of my brother, who's also here as well. Um. Did, did the Germans have equivalent of chaplains in World War Two? Oh, that's very difficult. Yes, is the answer. But um, I think, you know, as the Hitler regime went on, God became very much less and less. He, he used God in the beginning of his regime, obviously. But yeah, they did, they did have chaplains, but I've never come across any um, reference to them, mainly because I've been looking at British chaplains. Okay. Uh, very remiss of me not to have looked at German chaplains, but, you know, um, there's plenty, plenty of time left. I can do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No, they certainly had them. Thank you. Okay. And um, if I can just for a second part of the question is, has, did the role of chaplain evolve much between World War One and World War Two? Is there any obvious differences? You talked no. about one, we talked about one chaplain, I think, who carried out uh, an act of sabotage. Was was that different from World War One? Were they more... Um, uh, yeah, I think it's changed was when everything changed in between the wars um uh, the chaplain's department shrank a lot they didn't do a huge amount of work so they had to get back they had to relearn some of the things they'd learned in the first world war like the importance of chaplains having a proper training for example yeah. and having some basic military and medical things but uh, no the interwar years were a bit of a you know they just had to get back into it and uh, and start again basically okay great in Thank terms you. of military you know in terms of spiritual stuff then of course they just carried on as they had been Always. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nice to see you, Adrian. <laughs> thank you. Thanks again, Linda. Any other questions? 
can I sorry yes can I it's Adrian again hi again yes can I just say thank you um I actually live in Gloucester but we used to live near Wantage many years ago so uh thank you for the invitation tonight as well yeah um, yeah much, much appreciated so no, no questions just, just to thank you <laughs> I think you've been let off the hook <laughs> Well, thank you, Linda. It's been fascinating um, listening to you this evening, and I've certainly learned a lot more. And uh, obviously, we heard you um, give your talk on Woodbine Willie at the festival a few years ago. So, uh, thank you. And what, what can I ask? What is your latest work? What are you working on at the moment? Oh. Um, lots of lots of different things. I'm actually hoping to go back, um, not to Chaplin's, to go back to a previous book of mine about the polar explorers and, and what they did in the Second World War and do something uh, a little bit more on, on that line. Um, but I am thinking also of um, Royal Naval Chaplin's. I think that's some, a thread that I need to um, develop. Yes. Oh, it's loads of stuff, really. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we we look forward to hearing you talk at the festival yeah, hopefully actually, in person <laughs> in person yes i haven't actually got anything you know that's sort of like on the boil ready for publication or anything at the moment and i've got a bit of a lockdown lockdown brain as well i think it's not functioning at peak level at the moment can i, can I ask one more question please if, if i may it's adrian again yeah sorry to be cheeky but uh, well yeah. the opportunity is here so how does how does the sort of role of modern day chaplains compare them with maybe world war ii as, as a role evolved even you know, bringing it forward probably 70 years is it, is it very different do we know um it's very much the same in that um the the, the priority is for you know the spiritual welfare of the troops uh, also to be the listening ear a lot of a lot of the sort of um, pastoral work is the same because the, the situation for example in in helmand in afghanistan is different and it involved you know, people going out on patrol um and there's, there was quite a bit of controversy about whether the chaplain should go out on small patrols because they they might get in the way or they, they uh, they might feel that they needed to be taken over but they were in Camp Bastion they did go out to forward operating bases and basically their aim was to get as near to the men at all times as possible so I think that was moved on from what happened particularly with the airborne padres in the second world war you know they sort of uh, no I've lost the word <laughs> no not comment what's the word they, they modeled it yes modeled it Yes. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Linda. Yeah. It's fascinating to talk to present-day padres. Of course, there's a lot they can't tell you, but there's also a lot that they can tell you. So, um, very interesting to talk to them. Yeah. Any additional questions? I think. Um, sorry, so Adrian again. My, I think my brother Mark Smith might want to ask a question. Uh, I think. I think he's he's unmuted. He, I, don't, I don't know if you can hear me. I can't. Oh, we can now. Yes. Yes, hello. hello there. Hi, Linda. I'm just going to turn my iPad off. Can you hear me? Can you? Yes. Yes. Excellent. My, from my um, experiences, I did 36 years in the military. Um, I was only one off, so I was exposed to my forte. And I served in Afghanistan, and I have experience of how important the padres are. Particularly once we had casualties, people blown up when we were sending home in boxes, is awful. Um, actually, the Canadians used to pipe their troops home and it was so rewarding, refreshing to have those spiritual people to give you some sort of uh, hope for the body going home to the families. But after I left um, Afghanistan, I, I went back into a sort of training role at Cosford for a little while. And there we had amazing padres. We had such a, a wide spectrum of faiths. I don't know if you touch on that subject in the second world, whether they had all the different faiths that we have at the moment in the military. No, I know that there's that there's a, a wide variety of, of different sort of uh, faith provisions now, um, but I didn't come across uh, anything like that in the second world, except for the different Christian denominations. Um, if I'd looked at possibly the war in other parts of the world, I probably would have. Okay, because actually now we have tremendous yeah. support for all the diff different denominations, you know. It's just incredible how many, how many people are involved in the faith side, in the military now. Hmm. Yes, 
that's just so, so it's fascinating. Well, I, I, thank you for sharing, you know, your experience of repatriation and things like that, because I forgot to say it's a very important uh, role, and that's a major difference, of course, in uh, the First World War, all the all the, the men were left there, um, you know, and then the, and now everything is repatriated, and that's yeah. uh, about half okay. a, half a half little bit about it. repatriation, if you're interested, that is. Okay, um, yeah. For a little while, I mean, one of the strangest repatriations, we had a Romanian guy that got blown up in a vehicle, um, very sad. When it came to repatriating, we had like an orthodox church, we had these people in black costumes. It was really quite eerie actually, and they had a big full length um, photograph, picture of him marching round when we did the uh, repatriation. I knew this guy, and it was like so strange to repatriate a body by seeing the picture of that person normally it's just a, a coffin with a flag and a hat you know and uh, we have some music and uh, so that, that was one scary one but I will share one other with you and it was um, a young captain 23 year old girl just outside Kandahar oh, oof, the vehicle went up and she was killed and it was just tragic it did him around on the base at that time but two vehicles back, her boyfriend was uh, one of the first on the scene. It was a, a horrendous to see that side. When it came to repatriator though, the Canadians, um, these troopers that survived, were in their like hospital beds at the aircraft. So as the Hercules came in, um, they're there. It was just so sad to see them. They were laying there battered. But um, the uh, they had like a, a piper and they play um, Amazing Grace that tune and to this day every time i hear that amazing grace now the hairs the feeling in my body is just immense you know so i'll i'll i i do not want to leave on a sad note but uh, thank you very much for the talk this okay, evening no, thank you for sharing with us yes indeed thank you so are they, they, i think there don't be any to be any arms waving for kids <laughs> <laughs> i've i've stunned them uh, I think I, I, I think we'll probably um, end the talk there. So thank you everybody for okay. taking part, and thank you. thank you special thank you to Linda. And I just remind you, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Linda's book, it's available from the Wallingford Bookshop. And details of how to contact the Wallingford Bookshop are on our Facebook page and on our Twitter um, site as well. And if you'd like to give a small donation to the festival to ensure that we can continue to give talks over the next few months, that would also be wonderful. Our next talk is on Saturday the 4th of July and it's called Sex and Sexuality in Stuart Britain. So it's going to be something a bit different um, and it's by a lady, um, Andrea Zuvich, who is a 17th century historian. And then we also have a romantic fiction event taking place on the 22nd of July. Details of both talks are available on our website, um, on our Facebook page and via our newsletter. And we will continue to give events over the next few months. So thank you again, Linda. And I can just say thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yes. On another occasion, it'll be in, in person. In some yes. Way yes. Yeah, well, hopefully you. for your next book release, we'll actually see you in person at the festival. Yeah. <laughs> thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your point. Bye.